Welcome to episode 46 of Engaging Franciscan Wisdom as we begin the third year of this podcast, Amazing Grace. My name is Sister Michelle Lallier, and I'm your host today. I'm happy to introduce our guests, Gary and Joanne Dahl. Welcome, Gary. Welcome, Joanne. Hello. Hello, Michelle. <laughs> oh, it's great to have you on. So, great. Gary, welcome to the podcast for the first time being on it. Yeah. And uh, Joanne, you had this initial intuition that a podcast such as this would be a positive way to share Franciscan values and spirituality. And you were the first to be interviewed in October of 2020. We're blessed to have both of you. I know, isn't that a wow? <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, well, we're blessed to have both of you with us as we probe the mystery, the gift, and the challenge of committed relationships in this case of marriage. I look forward to our conversation. So you've been Franciscan associates for over 30 years and have been residents of Little Falls, the same town as our mother house is located in, for all 42 years of your marriage. Gary, you grew up in the Red Wing area and Joanne, you were in the area of Northeast Minneapolis and you met one day you met one another further south in Winona, Minnesota, where Gary, you studied at Winona State University, and Joanne, you were nearby at St. Teresa's. Professionally, you both worked with public education for over 30 years, and currently, you're both retired. Your love of travel, biking, and hiking is evident, and your living on the Mississippi River south of Little Falls nourishes you further with its beauty and living presence, which reminds you that God is near. You value lifelong learning, which continues now as former educators, and you share this deep love and appreciation of nature, to which your faith has been and is at the very heart of your journey. You've both been blessed with families rich in love and see yourselves as being incredibly blessed and grateful for those blessings. So I trust that this conversation will also be a blessing for you and for all of us who tune in to listen. Personally, I'm grateful for your presence in my life over the years, and I'm excited to have you share something of your relationship, something of your life learnings on the podcast. We're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> So, Joanne, when you were looking for a partner for life, at some point, you and Gary chose each other. How is it that you met Gary and then came to know that you wanted to share the rest of your lives together? Well, as you said, we met in Winona. And, of course, I was at St. Teresa's, which was a Franciscan institution. Mm -hmm. And even before we met each other, Gary, who was finishing up his time at Winona State would wander over to our campus and attend daily mass. Mm -hmm. And so we actually attended mass together before we even uh, met each other, which is kind of interesting because then we ended up being married in that very chapel. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we knew what we were getting into. I think we were both very young. I mean, I was only barely 22 and Gary five years older than that. I think we knew we loved each other and we had both found a good person and that we shared a common spiritual yearning to to grow closer to God. And we just jumped in feet first. <laughs> and I think with faith, when it's defined as in Hebrews, faith, the assurance of things hoped for. So we jumped in with all sorts of hopes and dreams for our future and and many of them didn't establish. <laughs> you know, we mm -hmm. would have imagined that we would have raised children and had a family and and we didn't have that that blessing, that gift in our life, but other things presented. So, so I think we just jumped in with faith and, and let it unfold. Mm -hmm. And it's been unfolding ever since, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Gary, do you have more to add to that? Well, it's... It... 
just that it, it really fits well with a marriage with the whole idea of continual conversion that's so embedded in the Franciscan spirituality. In a married relationship, there's always that intermingling of spirits and experiences that constantly drive or are being unfolded within the relationship mm-hmm. so that you know, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity to experience that continual conversion in, in a relational experience as well. It's not separate from the body of God or body of Christ. It serves in that way as well to help us see ourselves better. Mm. So, Gary, to continue on that thread, as noted, you've been united in marriage for 42 years. And you told me at one point how married life was given to the two of you as a gift, one in which you learn about humility and mutuality. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I'll try. You know, I might not have phrased it that way when we first met in terms of being gift, but I kind of come from the perspective, at least at this juncture in my life, where I I see everything as gift Mm -hmm. and and that I didn't deserve or wasn't entitled to, or there wasn't something I merited. It was purely gratuitous, God loving and manifesting God's self in in creation. And so it seems to me that if we want to live in that image and likeness, we, we have to model that perspective as best we can in all our relationships. And I, I certainly see that in our my relationship to Joanne, that who she is and the wonderful person that she is has been gifted to my life to share and experience. And there is a great sense of gratitude for that, but also a humility that, you know, in the same way I didn't deserve to be born into this world, it was gratuitous. The same is true in relationship to another human being who, you know, is on the same journey that I'm on. I have the opportunity to to walk that journey in, in a spirit of love. Mm-hmm. And that love constantly challenges us to let down our guard and open further and to love deeper and experience more completely all the gifts that God shares with us. And so, yeah, yeah, it's incredibly humbling because it's the avenue by which as we move on our spiritual journey, we've been doing that together as a couple. Mm -hmm. That kind of that sense of what you have received, then you give as gift. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Joanne, Gary just mentioned about the shared journey that you have together. This is an movement toward an experience of the we, not just one plus one, but a we. I'm wondering, can you say more about what that looks like for you? Yes, but I do also want to say one more thing about gift, because I think that when we talk about choosing each other in marriage, it's true. I chose Gary, Gary chose me, but then in faith, we also believe that God chose us for each other. And when you have a gift mentality or modality, it's a different kind of way you receive. If you go up and acquire something, that's different. But if you get something as a gift, that has a receptivity to it that is completely different. It requires gratitude, openness, and humility because the giver saw something in you that, that needed that gift. So I think that there's a whole receptivity in seeing another person in any relationship you have as being a gift to you in your life at that time, at that moment. And it it makes a difference in how you interact, I think. Mm -hmm. So I really think that idea of gift is is a crucial kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a mindset that's not common in our kind of broader culture here in much of the United States. So as I hear you, it just is so refreshing. Yes. And you know, our shared journey, well, 
I would like to tell you that I'm sitting next to the same man I married 42 years ago, and I am, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sitting next to the same woman either. And if you saw pictures of us from our wedding day, yeah. physically you would see that we are different people. Yeah, yeah. We are also different people spiritually and emotionally, and I just think that's inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, change is inevitable, and some changes, I think, are the result of circumstances, life circumstances. Like mm -hmm. I said, we would raise a family. We didn't. So that changed our trajectory in life a little bit. <laughs> we used to spend nearly every summer hiking in the mountains, probably for about 30 years, backpacking and then llama packing, you know, up in elevation, 10,000, 11,000 feet elevation and beautiful country. And that was our summer journey every summer for 30 years. Wow. But 30 years of that and a few injuries, a few aging, <laughs> you know, joint issues. And that is no longer something for us. Mm -hmm. So there's a letting go and an embracing of what's next. And I really think that's part of the marriage journey and any long-term relationship, letting go of what was and embracing what's next. Mm-hmm. Gary mentioned that continual conversion, which is rooted in an openness to be willing to let go of whatever barriers to spiritual growth you're harboring mm -hmm. and allow God to do the work needed to change you. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of that long-term marriage dance too. Yeah, I can just about taste or feel the challenge that is at times. Yes. I'm not married in the same way you are, but I do know that continual conversion journey. And there's certain moments or places where I find an inner resistance or I want to push it along. And and so it's a constant learning of how to stay with the movement of the spirit. Unfortunately, we have been able to grow together. Mm-hmm and support and encourage each other along that journey. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's not, that doesn't happen in every relationship, but fortunate for us, we have been able to grow together. And I think in part, because we're not riding this boat willy nilly, yeah. but we have a shared common trajectory mm -hmm. and that we both want to grow deeper and deeper in relationship with God and with each other. We are our goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a lot to chew on, but very <laughs> rich in its implications, right? And you embody it because of who you have become and are becoming. So, Gary, I've heard you speak about the opportunity that we have as human beings to receive the generosity of love. And I'm using that with a big L to receive God, who's revealed through the scriptures to be love. So to receive the generosity of love and to participate in God's own self. Can you say something about how this is expressed in your marriage? Hmm. Simple question, don't you think? <laughs> I, I think it's expressed in the totality of our experience we, that we bring to the marriage. Let's say... You know, I spend a lot of time where I attempt as best I can to be a contemplative spirit whereby uh, the presence of God it, it is, it, I'm seeking it, I'm experiencing it, and I'm wanting to express it. And that can be on an individual level. But the minute I come maybe from the old house where I have been sitting and thinking, I walk into this married life mm. that for it to have true meaning for me, it has to also share that more singular kind of experience, seemingly singular, because I think as we contemplate God in his presence, I think we get to that point where connectedness to all things, whether it be trees or this beautiful river that we live by, or, or the flowers and the plants that grow, Joanne is growing around the yard, that there's this underlying connectivity of love that is shared by both of us. And that both bring some beauty and some constancy 
into that experience in ways that help us to grow as a couple. And yet it, there is that underlying vulnerability as well that contemplation teaches us that, yes, we reach to God, but it only has meaning when God reaches back to us, when God fills that moment with what we need and, and the fullness of who we can be and are. And we then share it with one another. You mm -hmm. know, however, Joanne in a very short time will be going to Greece for, for two weeks and I will be without her. But I know that what she brings back from Greece is something that will be shared. Mm -hmm. And that it will serve to elevate our relationship, our understanding of the world, and hopefully impart some grace as to how we then walk into the world together after that journey. And so there's that constancy of, of growth that I think happens in healthy relationships. And it's not without its difficulties because we're still human and Im imperfect in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. I think there's a, con what you're saying is that there's a constant willingness to offer up oneself kind of naked, <laughs> you know, here I am. Yeah, that, I think she's correct. You know, the idea of naked before God, and we're not as generous as being naked beings in front of other human beings, because we don't want to appear vulnerable or weak or yeah. flawed, because yeah. we guard ourselves. But in a marriage I, I, that's working, I think... The other person serves as a mirror because there's things about me that I can't see. Mm -hmm. There's parts that I need somebody who can mirror back to me that which I can't see so that in seeing what I can't see, I might be able to grow through it or love my way through it as I like to see it. Mm -hmm. What I hear is a high degree of willingness to trust, to mm -hmm. trust that the other won't abuse what is vulnerable or frail. And that they will be there in that very human condition or reality. Yeah. And that under that, you share that even when you fail, as we human beings do, that God fills in or helps us through those difficult places. Yes. So, Joanne, you wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between transactional and transformational relationships. Yes. And that's kind of a complicated thing for me to talk about because I think it starts with the salvation story. Mm -hmm. I think that early on in faith, I saw really narrow chronological vision of the salvation story. You know, God created the world. God created man. Man was sinful and cast out. God took pity and sent along the prophets. Man was sinful. So in the end, God sent his only son. And it that sin-driven scenario kind of makes Jesus as a last-ditch rescue effort. Mm -hmm. And it's only about redemption. And it never rang true for me. And when we did the um, module on incarnation in Engaging Franciscan Spirituality um, course, we read John Don Scotus. Yes. Yes. And so he talked about Jesus being plan A, mm -hmm. um, Je Jesus being with God from the beginning, that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was not contingent on man's behavior, but God's original idea of ultimately uniting with the whole of creation in the person and flesh of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that is a scenario that is not just about redemption. It's about revelation. Mm -hmm. And it's about, um, I lost the word. Transformation. Transformation and relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you enter into the full unity. That's about relationship and God revealing God to us. And that means that it's transformational rather than transactional. And I think it's really easy to get into the transactional loop, mm -hmm. even spiritually. Oh, I'm sinful. I ask for forgiveness and now I'm good. Whoops, I sinned again. I'll go back, you know, and ask for forgiveness again. Boom, 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 boom. As long as I count off all my sins, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And in, in relationship, I sometimes hear young people talking about, well, he got to go hunting with his buddies. So I get to have 
spa weekend with my girlfriend and he gets to buy a new truck, but I'm going to get new furniture for the living room. And this idea of trying to always level the playing field, even everything out and just, you know, in any relationship, not just a marriage. So if you have a friend and you agree to meet at six o'clock and they show up at 6.15 and you're a little miffed at that, like, well, why were you late? Well, they say, I'm sorry. And then you forgive them and then you move on. But next time they're late again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they say they're really sorry. So now you really dig deep and forgive them. And then that's taken care of. But the next time they're late again, well, this eventually, this kind of relitigating this same old grievance that you have between each other is it's not going anywhere unless someone says, okay, I know that they're probably going to be late. I'm going to bring a book and just wait patiently and not be mad about it. Otherwise you're just stuck in that loop. And so that idea of transformational mindset rather than a transactional mindset, I think is really, really helpful. And that's another example of what's quite counter to our culture that tracks what's fair, what's just. And, and certainly with myself as a kid, being the oldest child of six, that was very common for us kids. He got a bigger piece of cake than I did. And it's kind of nurtured that there's a certain sense of justice, the the steward story in the scriptures, for example. Why did someone come in at five o'clock in the afternoon, get paid the same as me who's been working in the sun all day? God's generosity doesn't equate with kind of a fully human perspective of, you know, tit for tat or what should be right in our own eyes. Yeah. Uh, that's a big learning, isn't it? To see with, in a way, God's eyes. We were traveling recently and in the hotel where we were taking breakfast, they had a morning show on mm -hmm. and they were just about to introduce a guest speaker, an authority on relationships. And she was going to talk about how to win an argument. Whoa. And we both just looked at each other and laughed because, well, okay, you're already going in with a transactional mindset. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. That's who my guess is someone will win the argument and then you'll come back to it later. Yep. yep. And of course, it can never, in a uh, healthy relationship, it can never be about winning. Right. Mm -hmm. I think about forgiveness as an example, because forgiveness, I think, is one of the most transformational experiences we can have. Mm -hmm. And what usually gets in the way of forgiveness is a sense of justice. Well, I didn't deserve to be treated this way. Mm -hmm. And until you let that go and are willing to transform that sense of justice into something else the forgiveness can't flow. And it's true. She probably didn't deserve to be treated that way, <laughs> right. you know, but being able to kind of love your way through it, forgive your way through it and help the other person to see not from an angry perspective, but a whole different way of looking at it. And, and that takes intentionality in a relationship to help the other person to see when they've failed you. And that takes a level of both commitment and love and, and again, that vulnerability and that willingness to, in some cases, take on the pain and suffering of the other person's fault. Just as Christ came to transform the world, we're here to tra help transform each other if we can love each other and be open enough to the gifts that are right in front of us. You know, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is in our midst, mm. that in our midst implies that the kingdom of heaven lives now and in so many ways the only way we can bring heaven to one another is to be transformed by the incarnation that joanne referred to mm -hmm. that our incarnation of christ living in us and sharing our journey and that's such a great privilege to have christ walk with us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, I really do believe that the way we are in relationship with other will be determined by the relationship that we have with Christ. So if we are in a transactional relationship with Jesus, you know, and like, okay, I'm going to do these things and I'm in favor with God. And if I fall out of favor, I just have to do this, this, and this, and then I'm back in favor. If it's always this transactional thing, we're going to treat others in that way. But if we realize that 
we're really not at work to affect a change in God's attitude toward us, but God is at work in us to affect a change in our attitude about God and the other. That's transformational. That's a different kind of mindset. And I think that is necessary. I mean, you have to be able to say, where can I open myself up to make room for this person, you know, to be who they are? And what can I transform to bring this to a better place? And we don't usually go there. We usually take our side and try to win. Yeah. And just today, I read that 30% of the pastors were polled in across our country who believe that the walk to heaven is one where you do the right things. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that it misses the point of gift mm -hmm. that, you know, if I have to do this and this and this, to merit it, it kind of detracts from God being present, even when you screw up mm -hmm. and, and is ready to put that hand out, and lift you up and love you again. That constancy of love it, it, it will never be merited. It will always be gift. And so surrendering into the gift and recognizing our utter dependence and reliance on God to move us into God. I, and sometimes I, I guess I believe maybe that there's really very little I can do that can change how much God loves me. <laughs> I mean, I, I could try to be a better person or maybe I can be a crummy person. I don't think I'm really altering God's love that much. <laughs> so I think, again, it's about revelation and relationship and not simply redemption. And when I'm trying to tick off the boxes of doing all the right things to merit God's love, then I start watching other people and seeing if they're ticking off the right boxes too. And now I become judgmental. And so better to be vulnerable and let God work whatever changes are necessary inside to be open to transformation and not worry about if I exacted the right transactions this week. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm hearing is it's openness to transformation, but also actual engagement in the realities of life. It's not like magic that it just happens. We're open to it and God does it. We're partnering with God. And I hear that paradox, all is gift. And yet we're co-creating the gift by how we are in the world and what we're learning and how we share that with others. It's somehow much more a richer tapestry mm -hmm. uh, or more interactive than just re passively receiving a gift. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes the word blessing is also used for gift. And I, I love that word, but societally, we tend to think that blessing is a good job, a nice house, a new car, healthy kids, whatever. And, you know, everything is gift. So that means my bum knee is gift, right? Mm. You know, the sorrows are also gift. And yeah, it's not easy because you can't just say, okay, as long as I do all the right things, I'm going to get all the right blessings, that kind of prosperity theology. It's like, I don't really understand that. Mm. It doesn't make sense to me because everything is gifted to us and everything that we experience has the potential to draw us into deeper relationship with God or with each other. Yeah. Mm. It's how we respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there's been recent significant loss and sorrow in our family with the drowning of Joanne's nephew. And now our Italian children are losing their father. He, he's going to die probably within the next week. But one of the things that has really resonated for me is because I, I have this litany of affirmations that are blessings that it, I, I say on a regular basis, but one of the things that of late that I've added to that list is holy suffering, mm. not, not just holy as in God is holy, but holy as allowing ourselves to experience that suffering completely. And certainly Jesus is the greatest model of that. And so holy suffering with, with the sufferings of the world, the sufferings in your personal life, and of course, the significant loss of people we love so very much. But you don't want to wallow in the suffering, but you want to experience it deeply, mm -hmm. completely, and, and move through it in a spirit of love and vulnerability that that suffering then can serve to transform all 
that we're not. And the suffering is, is such an entry point, I think, to be living in the image and likeness of the Christ who who suffered so greatly. <laughs> so finding that willingness to enter in holy in suffering has been something of late that I think has been such a source of hope because it mirrors what we see God doing. And and I would add that Gary's gotten, he got pretty good at suffering. <laughs> mm. uh, I would tend to kind of try to avoid, avoid any suffering, but he would say, and you're dealing with sorrow, don't run from it. Love your way through it. Don't run from the sorrow, embrace it and love your way through it. And I think that's good, good advice. And then also part of the journey. Yeah. And I, it just resonates with me as well, that the difference between how we'd hoped things would be or the fullness of life we imagined could be and what it actually is mm -hmm. to stay present to that and move through it for me is very related to grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. To yeah. releasing, letting go, because we do care and we're losing someone or something, whether it's a dream, a person, a, a place, a time. And that in the grieving, there is the capacity to release and let go and accept the gift that's sometimes hidden within it. And I, I just see that so modeled in Jesus' life when he had hoped toward the end of his life that this cup could be passed from him, for example, and yet he stayed in. And it was through that dying, that suffering dying, that new life came forth that transformed our own lives. Mm-hmm. And he loved his way through it. Yes. Yes, that's right. So that's our model. We're not to avoid suffering. I tend to want to fix things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a pretty big social sickness right now, wanting to fix everything. Yeah. Well, this has been very rich, even as we've been addressing areas of poverty. And that's part of that paradox that you referred to earlier. I'm wondering if we could take a couple of minutes to look at more explicitly the Franciscan element that so permeates who you are and how you live. So you're, as noted, longtime Franciscan associates. What does that mean for you? Or are there particular Franciscan values or perspectives or stories that inspire or encourage you? Yeah. So I mentioned that we were married in a Franciscan chapel at the College of St. Teresa in Winona. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Little Falls and uh, we were swimming, I think at the, the health and rec center. And one day walked down the hall and we entered the chapel and we felt that we're in a kindred space. You know, this is it because the same sort of Franciscan, the same Assisi style with the pillars, it was very similar in style to the chapel that we were married in. But also we just immediately felt a kindred spirit and we knew that we wanted to get to know these women that lived in this place and worshiped in that chapel. But it was before we knew a single sister, we knew this is where we belong. These are our people. We've got to get to know these folks, you know. Mm, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I think I could expound on some of the Franciscan values that are so important to us, but truly what has drawn us in as much as going to Assisi or anything else are, are the sisters that abide in that space. Mm -hmm. And live the values. And live the values. And to me, there's such a heroic spirit that lives there with that desire to, to serve those who have been marginalized in some way or are hurting and suffering that constant wanting to reach out and make the world a, a better place. They have so enriched us, enriched our lives because of the way they live their lives. Mm -hmm. And as much as the Franciscan values that we learned in the uh, Franciscan spirituality, the truth is that it's being lived in those beautiful women that inhabit that space and have the a world in, in ways that you know, sometimes it's hard for us to even fathom the number of people that have been served in their time as a result of their love and their care and their commitment to the Franciscan spirit. So 
to to me, it, it's really more about those individuals, those beautiful women, than what I might have learned from Francis. Mm-hmm. I will say one thing that you know, initially growing up, I thought that Francis was the easy saint. <laughs> you because, did, huh? Yeah, yeah, because he's just a nice guy who loves nature. Oh, that's great. I can follow that. But then I realized that Francis is pretty challenging because France, all the saints love God, of course. Mm -hmm. But Francis tries to love as God loves. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty challenging way to be. That's that's not the easy (laughs) thing. No. And, And I do love that, but. Francis didn't get it all right either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like the rest of us don't get it all right. We we try to find a model and a way of living our lives that will bring about the hope for fulfillment that we, we all desire. But he certainly helped open us to the idea of being willing to suffer on behalf of God and especially suffer with those who are suffering in this world. We are called as Franciscans to reach out to those people as best we can to ease their suffering and to know that they don't walk in this world alone. Mm -hmm. Francis modeled that and was loved for that. And God worked through him because of that. Mm -hmm. I was just reading an article this past week on capitalism. And so much of the middle centuries were informed by Francis and his idea of poverty. How do you live a gifted life and still have that recognition of your own poverty, your own utter dependence on God. And and I think he's still teaching us that, and we're still trying to learn it. He also teaches us that God wasn't done speaking and God is still speaking to us. And to have that spirit of poverty gives us, I think, a better opportunity to truly hear it and begin to see as God sees and love as God loves. And Francis helped us. Yep, that's helped me in, in recognizing that su- such a big part of the journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think for me too, I think I'm still unpacking a lot about Franciscan spirituality. So for years I sang the canticle of the sun song, you know, praised brother wind, sister sky. I can't, I can't remember any of the words right now, of course. Mm-hmm. But I started thinking about what Francis is really saying and seeing to see all creation, not as resource, but as relationship. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Well, it's a whole new, that's a whole new mindset. Yeah. And it, in my view, it is the exact mindset that is needed today if we are going to see a planet that is still healthy and viable 50 years from now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm still seeing richness in Franciscan values and spirituality that I, you know, kind of glossed over at first. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. And and of course, then there's the, the huge challenge for all of us, whether it be you, Sister Michelle or Joanne or I, What is mine to do? Mm. What is ours to do to help bring about God's desire for God's people? And that would be his world as well, which he loves. There's so many beautiful things in creation and they were created out of that same love that created us out of love. And so how do we encounter our world in a, a manner that we might be conduits for that transformation that Joanne was talking about? And how do we heal this world, this time and space and God's wondrous creation? What is our role in bringing about both peace and restoration to our planet and that same peace and restoration to one another? Whoa. Well, that is that is opening a whole northern doorway, isn't it? And yeah. <laughs> I think this has been such a rich conversation, which we may at some point continue to move forward in different directions, but through the lens of your marriage, how it opened naturally to global, universal, we might even say cosmic components because we're relating with God and that love is not limited by people or time or place. It is 
unconditional in its intent and in the experience of God. So I'm wondering if you have any last thing you'd like to say as we bring a close or you're, you're feeling we can close here either way. Honestly, I think we've, we've given so much for ourselves to chew on and think about because sometimes as we talk, we begin to see that we have a lot more work to do. <laughs> yeah, not not just in our marriage, but in life in general. And I have a person I get to walk into that life with who I yeah. can love and trust and I know has my best interest at heart will help me stay humble, mm. help me stay centered. And that's how we walk with one another. And, and uh, I'm so grateful to be able to do that with Joanne. Mm. And I'm grateful as well. Yeah. I think that's a theme that runs through this entire conversation. Um, so as we draw to a close with gratitude, I want to thank you, Gary and Joanne, for being loving companions to one another as spouses and as part of our Franciscan community and for being with us on the podcast today. Your rich faith experiences and reflections invite us to consider our own relationships and to give thanks for the amazing capacity we have as human beings to learn about God, about loving and being loved and being instruments of that love to others, to all of creation. So once again, I want to thank you. Thank, thank you. Michelle. Thank That's you. And thank you. Yes, thanks for just being a part of our life. Mm. Tis good. <laughs> God bless. Bye-bye. Thanks to you listeners for tuning in to the podcast today. I'm looking forward to episode 47, which will be an interview with three of our Latin American associates. In conversation with Arlen Casco in Nicaragua, Camilo Pereira in Colombia, and Veronica Ribadeniera in Ecuador, we will hear of their journeys to Franciscan life, their current work and collaboration across Latin America, and listen in to some of their dreams as they look ahead. Until then, may you be blessed with peace and all good. <laughs>